Hello, ladies and gentlemen and girls and boys of all ages. Welcome back to another day of How Horrible Can Prosecutors Get? Yes, the Julian Assange extradition hearing, day 12. Oh, boy. Yes, we already have them coming out and saying that they would do this to any and all journalists anywhere in the world that publish classified information. Yep, the lies are laid bare, cards are on the table, and we see exactly what they want and what they're doing and what they're up to, so... Let's go right into the testimony for day 12 with Professor John Sloboda. He was with Iraq Body Count, who attempted to get a database of civilian deaths based on a compilation of credible published material. Their work's been recognized by the UN, EU, and the Chilcot Inquiry. And he said on the stand that it is the duty of every party at war or in occupation to protect the civilian population and the targeting of civilians is a war crime. So, WikiLeaks published the Iraqi war logs. That was the single biggest accession of material to the Iraq body count. It added 15,000 more civilian deaths, plus provided extra detail on a lot of deaths they had already recorded. So IBC approached WikiLeaks. Julian Assange had been enthusiastic and invited them to join the media consortium involved in handling the material. There were 400,000 documents in the Iraq war logs. Assange had made very plain the great weight must be placed on document security and with careful redaction to prevent, in particular, names from being revealed which could identify individuals who might come to harm. Yeah, we saw with yesterday's proceedings that that was a lie. It's going to come into even more detail today. You're going to see the links that Assange went through to try and protect these people. This whole thing about how he published names and put people at harm, that was a lie from day one and they knew it. However, it was impossible to redact that volume of documents by hand. So WikiLeaks sought help in developing software that would help. IBC's Hamid Dardigan devised the software which solved the problem. Basically, you're stripping any word that isn't in an English dictionary. So, unlike a blacklist, which is where you go through and say, these are the words I don't want, and you go through it, you might miss something. Well, this is a whitelist. With a whitelist, you have a list of all of the words you'll allow, and everything else gets redacted. So, they basically have an English dictionary, so it's automatically going to remove any Arabic names. They also made sure to remove any other potential identifiers like occupations. They added a few things like key acronyms, and they developed it and tested it on sample batches until it worked well. Julian Assange was determined redaction should be effective and resisted pressure for media partners to speed up the process. So this whole thing about, you know, Assange just rushed it on and just dumped it out. It, it, uh, no, it's exactly the opposite. Other members of the media were chomping at the bit. Going, come on, we want to release this, we want to release this. And Assange was like, no, 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 hold on, let's make sure we've done this properly. So Assange always meticulously insisted on redaction. On balance, they over-redacted for caution. Sloboda could only speak on the Iraqi war logs, but these were published by WikiLeaks in a highly redacted form, which was wholly appropriate. So Joel Smith is cross-examining for the U.S. government. So, wait a minute, what happened to James Lewis? <laughs> Did they finally have enough of him? Did they finally think, hey, maybe this isn't the best guy to be doing our cross-examinations here? So maybe they were sensible and replaced him, or maybe it was some other reason. I don't know. But we got a different prosecutor cross-examining. So Murray relates, as is the standard prosecution methodology in this hearing, Mr. Smith set out to trash the reputation of the witness. And he adds, I found this rather ironic as a rock body count has been rather good for the government. Each time the Americans flattened Fallujah and everyone in it, there was not some little journalist writing up the names of the thousands of dead on a miraculously surviving broadband connection. Iraq body count is a good, verifiable, minimum number of civilian deaths, but no more. Unfortunately, it's been used as propaganda for the war wasn't that bad brigade. My own view, meaning Murray's, is that you can usefully add a zero to their figures. But I digress. So, it's what you'd expect from the prosecution. Sloboda has no expertise in military intelligence, doesn't hold a security clearance, and that means it's illegal for him to be in possession of all this information, and so on, yeah. 
and also doing a little bit of trivial pursuit, like Lewis was. But we get to the software. He said it was IBC who came up with the software and not Assange. Sloboda, yes. Smith, how long did it take to develop the software? Sloboda, a matter of weeks. Smith, redaction would then remove all non-English words, but it would still leave vital clues to identities like professions. They had to be edited by hand. Sloboda, no, I already said the professions were taken out. The software was written to do that. Hey, Smith, you might want to try this thing called listening. Smith, it would leave in buildings? Sloboda. No, other words like mosque were specifically removed by the software. Smith. But names which are also English words would be left in, like Summers, for example. Sloboda. I don't think there are any Iraqi names which are also English words. Smith. Dates, times, places? Sloboda. I don't know. Smith. Street names? Sloboda. I don't know. And Murray adds as an aside that Sloboda was obviously disconcerted by Smith's quick-fire technique and had been rattled into firing back equally speedy and short answers, which is kind of what Lewis was trying to do as well. Remember, trying to get them to, to nice, short, concise answers that they can manipulate. But he says, if you think about it a moment, Iraqi street names are generally not English words. A bit later, Smith says, Mr. Assange called it regrettable that informants were at risk, but said WikiLeaks only had to avoid potential for unjust retribution, and that those who had engaged in traitorous behavior or had sold information ran their own risk. Can you comment? Sloboda. No, he never said anything like that to me. Smith. He never said he found the process of redaction disturbing? Sloboda. No, on the contrary. He said nothing at all like that to me. We had a complete meeting of minds on the importance of protection of individuals. And if you remember, they had a guy on the stand who was actually there when Assange supposedly made these kinds of statements, and the judge wouldn't even let him give his opinion, which is that it's a complete misquote. Assange never said any of that. So here he is once again asking someone who never heard Assange say anything like that. The only evidence we have it and evidence in scare quotes, <laughs> would be the hearsay that was just put in without any opportunity to cross-examine it. That is huge misconduct. But Anyway, Smith reads an affidavit from apparently someone named Dwyer, and we'll get to that question a little later. But it said that the publication of the SARs put cooperating individuals in grave danger. Dwyer purported to reference two documents which contained names. Dwyer also stated that military and diplomatic experts confirmed individuals have been put in grave danger. Smith, how do you explain that? Sloboda, I have no knowledge. It's just an assertion. I haven't seen the documents referred to. Smith, might this all be because Mr. Assange took a cavalier attitude to redaction? Sloboda, no, definitely not. I saw the opposite. Smith, so why did it happen? Sloboda, I don't know if it did happen. I haven't seen the documents referred. And Murray adds, I have no idea who Dwyer is, name is heard, or what evidential value his affidavit might hold. It is a constant tactic of the prosecution to enter highly dubious information into the record by putting it to witnesses who have not heard of it. It is also not clear to me why those published documents were not produced to the court and to Professor Sloboda. I mean, yeah, that's what you do. You give the witnesses the documents ahead of time. I mean, of course, we saw that they are also doing things like giving them hundreds of pages a few hours before they testified. I mean, th this is crazy. This whole thing is crazy. All right, moving on to Kerry Schenkman. He wrote a book on the history of the Espionage Act, and the evidence he presents is extremely important because of the clear intent shown by the U.S. government in cross-examination to now interpret the Espionage Act in a manner that will enable them to prosecute journalists wholesale. Shankman began his evidence by explaining that the 1917 Espionage Act, under which Assange was charged, dates from the most repressive period in U.S. history, when Woodrow Wilson had taken the U.S. into the First World War against massive public opposition. It had been used to imprison those who campaigned against the war, particularly labor leaders. Wilson himself had characterized it as the firm hand of stern repression. Its drafting was extraordinarily broad, and it was, on its surface, a weapon of political persecution. 
The Pentagon Papers case had prompted Edgar and Schmidt to write a famous analysis of the Espionage Act. It gave enormous prosecutorial discretion on who to prosecute and depended on prosecutors behaving wisely and with restraint. There was no limit on strict liability. The third or fifth receiver in the chain of publication of classified information could be prosecuted, not just the journalist or publisher, but the person who sells or even buys or reads the newspaper. The default position had become that the Espionage Act was used against the whistleblower, but not against the publisher or journalist, even when the whistleblower had worked closely with the journalist. Obama had launched the largest ever campaign of prosecution of whistleblowers under the Espionage Act. He had not prosecuted any journalist for publishing the information they leaked. Now, personally, I think it's clear that Obama would have gone after Assange if he thought he could get away with it. But, I mean, given the Pentagon Papers case and given all the other court cases and the precedents and everything else, he knew he couldn't get away with it. Well, now, here we are, and apparently they're getting away with it. So, Well, now we have Claire Dobbin cross-examining on behalf of the U.S. government, which, as Murray says, evidently is not short of a penny or two to spend on multiple counsel. So Dobbin started by stating that Mr. Shankman had worked for Julian Assange. Shankman clarified that he had worked in the firm of the great lawyer Michael Ratner, who represented Mr. Assange. But that firm had been dissolved on Ratner's death in 2016, and Shankman now worked on his own behalf. This all had no bearing on the history and use of the Espionage Act, on which he had been researching in collaboration with a well-established academic expert. Dobbin then asked whether Shankman was on Assange's legal team. He replied, no. Dobbin pointed to an article he had written with two others, of which the byline stated that Shankman was a member of Assange's legal team. Shankman replied that he was not responsible for the byline. Dobbin said that the article had claimed that the UK was illegally detaining Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy. Shankman replied, that was the view of the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, with which he concurred. And so there's a lot of attacking him, asking if he can be an objective witness, things like that. Same old song we've gotten the whole time. Even asked if he was giving evidence pro bono. I mean, what does that have to do with anything? Are you getting paid, Dobbin? Somehow, Dobbin, I don't think you're doing this for free. Dobbin said that the defense claimed that the Obama administration had taken the decision not to prosecute Assange, but successive court statements showed that an investigation was still ongoing. Dobbin took him through several of these very slowly. Yep, this is the same old song. We've been getting the whole time. If Assange had really believed the Obama administration had dropped the idea of prosecution, then why would he have stayed in the embassy? Shankman replied that he was very confused why Dobbin would think he had any idea what Assange knew or thought at any moment in time. Why did she keep asking him questions about matters with which he had no connection at all and was not giving evidence? And more to the point, why isn't the judge stepping in? You're not supposed to be able to do that with witnesses. Anyway, it was standard Justice Department practice not to close off the possibility of future charges. But if Holder and Obama had wanted to prosecute, wouldn't they have brought charges before they left office and got the kudos, rather than leave it for Trump? Good question, Shankman. And he also said, Did I anticipate this indictment? No, I never thought we would see something as political as this. It is quite extraordinary. A lot of scholars are shocked. And then there's a couple of case references with Shankman keeps saying that you have to, again, look at each case because each case differs in the details. And Dobbin apparently doesn't get that. So Dobbin then asked Shankman whether unauthorized access to government databases is protected under the First Amendment. He replied that this is a highly contentious issue. There were, for example, a number of conflicting judgments in different appellate circuits about what constituted unauthorized access. Dobbin asked if hacking a password hash would be unauthorized access. Shankman replied this was not a simple question. In the present case, the evidence was the password was not needed to obtain documents. And could she define hacking in law? Dobbin said she was speaking in layman's terms. Shankman replied that she should not do that. We were in a court of law. And he was expected to show extreme precision in his answers. She should meet the same standard in her questions. Finally, Dobbin unveiled her key point. Surely all these contentious points were therefore matters to be decided in the U.S. courts after extradition. 
No, replied Shankman. Political offenses were a bar to extradition from the UK under UK law. And his evidence went to show that the decision to prosecute Assange under the Espionage Act was entirely political. So, we'll get the rest of that on day 13, which Murray doesn't have up yet at the time I'm recording it. He had posted a small post to say that he was uh, out with the pub with a friend after court instead of going ahead and starting writing. And, hey, he deserves this. As much work as he's put into it and as clearly it's been emotionally draining for him, I think, just judging by all of his comments and everything. And, I mean, I can only imagine then how it would feel for Julian Assange. But, yeah, he deserves the right to chill out for a while. And then... He even missed his new deadline and said it was because he had slept, and I hope he did. You know, it, It's a lot more important for me that he stay healthy and alert and everything and be able to bring us the rest of it than to have his Day 13 coverage a day early. So I'm really glad he's gotten some rest. I'm really glad he's you know had a night with his friends. But to round all of this out, he points out that Shankman was sent a 180-page evidence bundle from the prosecution on the morning of his testimony at 3 a.m. his time before giving evidence at 9 a.m. And like I said, that's just what they've been doing with all of these witnesses. He is then questioned on it. This happens to every key witness. Like almost every witness, his submitted statement addressed the first superseding indictment, not the last-minute second superseding indictment, which introduces some entirely new offenses. This is a ridiculous procedure. But he also says, having been very critical of Judge Bereitzer, it would be churlish of me not to note that there seems to be some definite change in her attitude to the case as the prosecution makes a complete horlicks of it. Whether this makes any long-term difference, I doubt, but it is pleasant to witness. So, maybe she won't be Judge Dalek so much anymore, which... I gotta say, I'm kind of disappointed by I mean, I've really been wanting to do the Dalek voice again. That's just a lot of fun to do. So. But anyway. She decided to hear all the evidence before deciding what is and is not admissible against the prosecution desire that almost all the defense witnesses are excluded as irrelevant or unqualified. As she will make that decision when considering her judgment, that is why the prosecution spent so much time attacking the witnesses ad hominem rather than addressing their actual evidence. That may well be a mistake. But we'll have to see. We'll have to see how this goes in the next day. So, yeah, he hasn't posted day 13 yet. So I can't give you any sly little teases as to what's coming up because I don't know what's coming up. We'll just have to see. So I hope you stay with me and keep watching through it. And the best way to do that is to hit like, subscribe, and the bell to make sure you get notified when I post new videos. And also, since no one else is covering this, hey, Shane, why are you only using Craig Murray as a source? Shouldn't you be using additional sources? Well, show me some. As far as I can tell, Murray is it. So, if you've got someone else who was there who's writing up something different, please show it to me. Otherwise, please share this around everywhere you can. Share this video. Share this blog post of Murray's. And if you like what I'm doing, please go to donate.bogosity.tv. Give whatever you can, even a few pennies in crypto. will help a lot more than you know. Thank you so very much. We'll be back for day 13 sometime after Murray gets it posted. Until then, stay strong and be free.